Hello, I'm Pastor Brian from Charlestown Baptist Church. We invite you to come and join us as the church gathers for worship. But until then, we put our sermons on video so that we can be a ministry to you and your family wherever you are. God bless you. So I'm going to start this morning where we left off last week. And I'm sure that some of you recall the gist of the sermon that I shared with you. We are, com <laughs> I'll remind you. We are both body and soul, right? We are flesh and we are spirit. And we had that verse from Galatians 5 that flesh and spirit kind of are at war with each other. They don't get along so very well. And I encourage you to understand and embrace the fullness of your identity in Christ, to know who you are in the spirit, to live in the spirit, and not so much in the flesh. Live out your calling as a saint of the Lord, a disciple of Jesus. And everybody told me, amen, that's a good sermon, brother. Preach on, preacher, amen. That's what you said. Well, maybe you said that on the inside, because we're not like that here. In <clears throat> <clears throat> and if you were here, you remember that I finished the sermon with a little short story about a wise old Indian chief, right? But some of you were not here. So I'm going to tell you that story again. There was once a wise old Indian chief. And he was sitting talking with his warriors about some things about life and good and bad. And the chief said, it's like you have two dogs living inside of you and they fight all the time. And one is a bad old mean dog that leads you to do evil. And the other dog is good and pure and leads you to do well. And they fight all the time. And one of the warriors said to him, But chief, who will win the fight? And the chief said, Depends on which one you feed. Right? Remember that part. Amen. Amen. So church, which side of you do you feed? Which part of your life do you cultivate? Do you nurture? Do you pursue and seek after and develop the matters of the Spirit, the things of God? Or are you more interested in the part of your life that consists of the material, the earthly, the worldly? Let me ask another question along the same lines. Are you living in the fullness of God's blessing in your life? Are you experiencing the heights of spiritual power on a daily basis? Are you walking boldly in the presence of God? Or does all that seem kind of a distant and remote concept to you? And perhaps you feel a little bit flat and far from him. My friends, today, in this pursuance of discipleship, we are going to discover, I'm going to share with you the key that unlocks the door of God's presence in your life. And it's not a secret. And it's not a mystery. And when I tell you what it is, you probably won't be very surprised. So here we go. The key that unlocks the door to God's presence in your life is obedience. Amen. Obedience. Do the things that God tells you to do, leads you to do, calls you to do. And you will experience more of his presence. And on the other hand, if you indulge the flesh, if you pursue life in this world, if you engage in regular, unrepentant sin, you will feel farther and farther and farther from him. That's brain surgery. That's rocket science right there. That's some high, high theology. Sin is bad for you and bad for your relationship with God. 
We're going to begin with Psalm 1, verses 1 to 3. Would you stand, please, that we'd honor the reading of God's word. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. Almighty God, help us to see clearly how your law, your, your perspective, your morality, your behavior, your word is the best for us. And give us the courage and the will to pursue it always. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Be seated, please. My friends, I want to see you thrive in your life. I want to see you know the blessings and the peace and the joy of the Lord, God's presence at work in you daily. And I have great confidence that God can and will make himself known in you, in your family, in our congregation as a whole. And he will bless and raise up his people for his purposes. His kingdom shall be fulfilled in us and through us. I am so confident in that. But we got to stop waiting for God to get on our program. <laughs> Rather, we need to get ourselves on his program. Psalm 1 tells us that there is a specific and direct connection between receiving the blessings and the fruit of God's grace and how we live our lives on this earth. Straight to the heart of the matter, no bones about it. Sin is bad for you. Sin causes damage in you. Sin damages your relationships with the people in your life. Sin puts a barrier between you and God. It is destructive and caustic and causes more damage than you ever guessed upon. As we embrace the word, and live out his word, and do that which we know we ought to do, working out our salvation day by day, in obedience to God's call and command, we avoid all the fallout, and all the hurt, and all the suffering, and all the degradation that comes with it. And we are more receptive to the blessings in the presence of God. We continue in sin, indulging the flesh, and we just keep building that wall. Just another brick in the wall between us and God. Barriers. And we don't know him so well in all that. And that is why you need to do all you can to stop that nonsense. Clean up your act. Cut those things out of your life. And stop excusing yourself. And stop justifying yourself. And stop blaming everybody else. And just plain old Jesus talked about something very powerful in Matthew chapter 5, part of the Sermon on the Mount. And he said, if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. If your right hand causes you to sin, chop it off. And it's better for you to, if one of your members perish, then your whole body be cast out. And believe it or not, there have been some in the history of the church that have taken these verses very literally and mutilated themselves thinking that they would please God by doing such. Now before you get handy with a kitchen knife, understand Hebrew language used a lot of hyperbole, exaggeration to kind of make a point. Okay, So I don't think we have to take this Literally, but the message here is quite clear. The Lord's point is, do what you got to do to change your ways. And stop that bad behavior. Get it out of your life. And pursue the goodness and the holiness and the joy of the Lord. The Apostle Paul said the same sort of thing in 1 Timothy chapter 4. He said, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. 
bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having the promise of the life that now is and that of which is to come. And when you discipline yourself, you learn how to tell yourself no. You learn how to do the right thing even when it's uncomfortable and inconvenient because simply it's the right thing to do. And it's a practice. It's something we learn to get good at. It's something as we develop it, over time it becomes easier and easier. In my world, my alarm clock clock goes off at 6 o'clock in the morning. And there are many, many, many days I would much rather turn it off and break it and throw it out the window. But, knowing myself, and knowing that I am a naturally fat guy, I am, I have to say no to that, and I have to discipline myself to get up and go do my routine at the fitness center to maintain a degree of health. I would much rather not have to do that every day, but I tell myself no, and I go and do the thing that I know is the right thing for me to do. And so far, it seems to be working. No heart attacks yet, so that's a good thing. And that's just a little bit of profit for my life. Greater profit comes, the greater blessings come when I discipline myself for godliness and tell myself no to that impulse to tell you exactly what I'm thinking when you said that harsh word to me. To say no when I feel like I'm not going to let them push me around, I'll show them. When that pride or greed or ego gets out of control and I want to react in a way that is damaging, when we're tempted to overindulge in that double chocolate cherry cheesecake or whatever other substance or activity it is that you know is bad for you, you learn to say no. The thing about discipline is the more you do it, the more you practice it, the easier it becomes. The more you say, whatever, the more you feed the flesh, the stronger those impulses become. Fortunately for us, we do not have to go to the extremes of plucking out an eye or chopping off a hand to prevent ourselves from indulging in sin. We have to agree with God that his word and his truth is better for us than the things that the natural mind would lead us to do. We have to agree with God that his word and his truth is better for us than the things that the natural impulses of the body and our fallen sin-filled minds would lead us to do. We agree with God and we decide to obey. And we choose to obey. And then the actions and the deeds will follow. Psalm 119, the longest chapter in the entire Bible. And it's a beautiful testimony to the power of God's word. And every verse has a reference to either God's law, God's word, God's statutes, God's commandments, along that. And the psalmist continually repeats the theme that God's word is best for me. And when I live in obedience to him, I'm so much better off. Psalm 119, verses 66 and 67. Teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I believe your commandments. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. Let me kind of put that into modern language for us. Good judgment and knowledge comes from the word of God. And as you teach it to me, God, I am wiser about my life because then I know the truth. When I went astray, that's when I got afflicted and ended up in a big old mess. But I know now that by keeping your word and doing the things you would have me do, oh God, I'm so much better off. If you remember your Old Testament history, which I'm sure you do, you know that the book of Deuteronomy is the second giving of the law of God. The first generation, the ones that came out of Egypt through the Red Sea and all that. They got the law of God on Mount Sinai. And they went up to the promised land, and they disobeyed in a big way. And God said, no, not for you. 
go away for 40 years, then come back. And so that first generation of Israelites, they died in the desert. And their children then became the adults and the grown-ups in the room. And before they went into the land of promise again, Moses gave them the law again. And that's where we get Deuteronomy. So they'd have it, be fresh in their minds, and they'd know it, and they'd do it. And Moses said in Deuteronomy chapter 30, See, I set before you life and death, good and evil, in that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments, his statutes, and his judgment, that you may live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you. But if your heart turns away so that you don't hear and you're drawn away and you worship other gods and serve them, I announce to you today, you shall surely perish. Life, death. With obedience comes life. With sin comes death. You see, the laws of God gave the people then and today some boundaries. Some boundaries, some limits. Stay within the, the borders of good and right behavior and you will live. You'll live well. Inside the fence, there's life and peace and love. You get outside the fence, it's going to hurt. Don't go there. It's bad for you. The blessing comes in doing the thing God calls us to do. The curse, the damage, the downfall comes when we decide, I know what God said, but oh, I got, I got a better idea. I got a better plan. How's that working out for you so far? <laughs> now, we New Testament believers were not under the law in the same way that the Israelites were. We're under grace. And his law does not apply to us because it's written on a scroll in a legalistic kind of way, but it's written in our hearts. And we have the indwelling Holy Spirit to guide us, to coach us, to strengthen us so that we can overcome life in the flesh, the temptation of sin. But this principle of boundaries, oh, it's powerful. That's where there's real freedom. Out there, it's trouble. When we lived down in Louisiana, there was an elementary school built in the great city of Lafayette. Never been to Lafayette? You can go try it one time. Festival of Katie Ann, good time. Anyway, so they built this elementary school. And it was in the middle of the city. And it was a good chunk of the city block. And there were streets on three sides. And they were fairly busy streets. A good number of cars went by on a regular basis. Well, the school got built. And August came around and they opened the school. But the contractors had not yet finished all the landscaping. So with these three busy streets, there was no fence around the schoolyard. And of course, the PTA was like, oh, protect our children, the contractors. I'm going as fast as I can, you know, those kind of things. So anyway, as you do in elementary school at recess, the kids went out to play in the yard. And nobody made rules. Nobody said anything. All the kids played up by the building. And they threw the ball back and forth and played tag and do all the kid stuff that they do because they didn't know the boundaries. They didn't know. Three weeks went by. Landscapers finished. The fence was put in. And again, nobody made a rule. Nobody said what you got to do, what you can't do. Kids went out to recess, and they scattered out, and they filled up the schoolyard. When you know where the boundaries are, you have so much more freedom. You have so much more joy. You have so much more movement. When the boundaries are uncertain, or when you ignore them altogether, there's confusion, there's ambiguity. My friends, God's word gives us good, solid boundaries. God's word is so much better for you than anything you would prepare for yourself. Do you want more of God in your life? Stay inside the boundaries. Stop the bad behavior. Stay away from sin. 
pursue living in the Spirit, living in obedience, doing the things that God asks you to do, and you will find that He is closer to you than ever before. And we know, too, sometimes, even the best circumstances, we jump the fence. <laughs> we go outside. We get ourselves in trouble. Because no, nobody's perfect. We all make mistakes. And as you know, Christians sometimes get caught up in all sorts of sin. And when that happens, you know what? There's an answer. God is quick to forgive and quick to restore if we have the courage to confess and repent and believe that his word is still better for us than our own bad ideas. Amen? Father God, we rejoice in you and we thank you for your truth, your mercy, and your grace. And I pray your blessings on us, that we would see your truth, that we would know your truth, that we would live in your truth about you and your word and about ourselves and who we are and how we live. Help us, O oh God. Strengthen us. Give us minds that are right for your sake and your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. In a few minutes, we're going to celebrate the table of the Lord the body and the blood that was given for us. Before we get to that part, I want to give us a time of reflection and meditation, and perhaps some of you need some prayers, and perhaps some of you need to get Jesus in your life and sort things out once and for all with him. And I'm happy to pray with you and, and, and encourage you and give you a word of counsel about those very things. And I invite you to stand with us together. Elizabeth will lead us in a song, and uh, if you have a burden, if you have a need, you come now. My prayer that this sermon has been a blessing to you and that the Lord spoke to you through these words. We appreciate your participation. If we can be of ministry to you or your family, feel free to give us a call at the church office, 304-725-5917. We look forward to hearing from you. Until then, God bless you.